Section 4 of The Stratagems and the Aqueducts of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Stratagems and the Aqueducts of Rome by Frontinus. Translated by Charles Bennett. The Stratagems, Book 1, Part 4. 7. How to conceal the absence of the things we lack, or to supply substitutes for them. Lucius Caecilius Metellus, lacking ships with which to transport his elephants, fastened together large earthen jars, covered them with planking, and then, loading the elephants on these, ferried them across the Sicilian Straits. When Hannibal on one occasion could not force his elephants to ford an especially deep stream, having neither boats nor material of which to construct them, he ordered one of his men to wound the most savage elephant under the ear, and then straightway to swim across the stream and take to his heels. The infuriated elephant, eager to pursue the author of his suffering, swam the stream, and thus set an example for the rest to make the same venture. When the Carthaginian admirals were about to equip their fleet, but lacked broom, they cut off the hair of their women and employed it for making cordage. The Massilians and Rhodians did the same. Marcus Antonius, when a refugee from Mutina, gave his soldiers bark to use as shields. Spartacus and his troops had shields made of osiers and covered with hides. This place, I think, is not inappropriate for recounting that famous deed of Alexander of Macedon, marching along the desert roads of Africa and suffering in common with his men from most distressing thirst when some water was brought him in a helmet by a soldier, he poured it out upon the ground in the sight of all, in this way serving his soldiers better by his example of restraint than if he had been able to share the water with the rest. 8. On distracting the attention of the enemy. When Coriolanus was seeking to avenge by war the shame of his own condemnation, he prevented the ravaging of the lands of the patricians while burning and harrying those of the plebeians, in order to arouse discord whereby to destroy the harmony of the Romans. When Hannibal had proved no match for Fabius, either in character or in generalship, in order to smirch him with dishonor, he spared his lands when he ravaged all others. To meet this assault, Fabius transferred the title to his property to the state, thus, by his loftiness of character, preventing his honor from falling under the suspicion of his fellow citizens. In the fifth consulship of Fabius Maximus, the Gauls, Umbrians, Etruscans, and Samnites had formed an alliance against the Roman people. Against these tribes, Fabius first constructed a fortified camp beyond the Apennines in the region of Sentinum. Then he wrote to Fulvius and Postumius, who were guarding the city, directing them to move on Clusium with their forces. When these commanders complied, the Etruscans and Umbrians withdrew to defend their own possessions while Fabius and his colleague Decius attacked and defeated the remaining forces of Samnites and Gauls. When the Sabines levied a large army, left their own territory and invaded ours, Manius Curius, by secret routes, set against them a force which ravaged their lands and villages, and set fire to them in diverse places. In order to avert this destruction of their country, the Sabines thereupon withdrew. But Curius succeeded in devastating their country while it was unguarded in repelling their army without an engagement, and then in slaughtering it piecemeal. Titus Didius at one time lacked confidence because of the small number of his troops, but continued the war in hope of the arrival of certain legions which he was awaiting. On hearing that the enemy planned to attack these legions, he called an assembly of the soldiers and ordered them to get ready for battle, and purposely to exercise a careless supervision over their prisoners. As a result, a few of the latter escaped and reported to their people that battle was imminent. The enemy, to avoid dividing their strength when expecting battle, abandoned their plan of attacking those for whom they were lying in wait, so that the legions arrived without hindrance and in perfect safety at the camp of Didius. In the Punic War, certain cities had resolved to revolt from the Romans to the Carthaginians, but wishing before they revolted to recover the hostages they had given, they pretended that an uprising had broken out among their neighbors, which Roman commissioners ought to come and suppress. When the Romans sent these envoys, the cities detained them as counter-pledges and refused to restore them until they themselves recovered their own hostages. 
After the defeat of the Carthaginians, King Antiochus sheltered Hannibal and utilized his counsel against the Romans. When Roman envoys were sent to Antiochus, they held frequent conferences with Hannibal, and thus caused him to become an object of suspicion to the king, to whom he was otherwise most agreeable and useful, in consequence of his cleverness and experience in war. When Quintus Metellus was waging war against Jugurtha, he bribed the envoys sent him to betray the king into his hands. When the other envoys came, he did the same, and with a third embassy he adopted the same policy. But his efforts to take Jugurtha prisoner met with small success, for Metellus wished the king to be delivered into his hands alive. And yet he accomplished a great deal, for when his letters addressed to the friends of the king were intercepted, the king punished all these men, and being thus deprived of advisers, was unable to secure any friends for the future. Gaius Caesar, on one occasion, called a soldier who had gone to procure water, and learned from him that Afranius and Petrius planned to break camp that night. In order to hamper the plans of the enemy, and yet not cause alarm to his own troops, Caesar early in the evening gave orders to sound the signal for breaking camp, and commanded mules to be driven past the camp of the enemy with noise and shouting. Thinking that Caesar was breaking camp, his adversaries stayed where they were, precisely as Caesar desired. When on one occasion reinforcements and provisions were on the way to Hannibal, Scipio, wishing to intercept these, sent ahead Minucius Thermus and arranged to come himself to lend his support. When the Africans were planning to cross over to Sicily in vast numbers in order to attack Dionysius, tyrant of Syracuse, the latter constructed strongholds in many places and commanded their defenders to surrender them at the coming of the enemy, and then, when they retired, to return secretly to Syracuse. The Africans were forced to occupy the captured strongholds with garrisons, whereupon Dionysius, having reduced the army of his opponents to the scanty number which he desired, and being now approximately on an equality, attacked and defeated them, since he had concentrated his own forces and had separated those of his adversaries. When Agesilaus the Spartan was waging war against Tisiphernes, he pretended to make for Caria, as though likely to fight more advantageously in mountainous districts against an enemy strong in cavalry. When he had advertised this purpose and had thus drawn Tisiphernes off to Caria, he himself invaded Lydia, where the capital of the enemy's kingdom was situated, and having crushed those in command at that place, he obtained possession of the king's treasure. 9. On Quelling a Mutiny of Soldiers When the consul, Aulus Manlius, had learned that the soldiers had formed a plot in their winter quarters in Campania to murder their hosts and seize their property, he disseminated the report that they would winter next season in the same place. Having thus postponed the plans of the conspirators, he rescued Campania from peril and, so soon as occasion offered, inflicted punishment on the guilty. When on one occasion legions of Roman soldiers had broken out in a dangerous mutiny, Lucius Sulla shrewdly restored sanity to the frenzied troops, for he ordered a sudden announcement to be made that the enemy were at hand, bidding a shout to be raised by those summoning the men to arms and the trumpets to be sounded. Thus the mutiny was broken up by the union of all forces against the foe. When the Senate of Milan had been massacred by Pompey's troops, Pompey, fearing that he might cause a mutiny if he should call out the guilty alone, ordered certain ones who were innocent to come interspersed among the others. In this way, the guilty came with less fear, because they had not been singled out, and so did not seem to be sent for in consequence of any wrongdoing, while those whose conscience was clear kept watch on the guilty, lest by the escape of these the innocent should be disgraced. When certain legions of Gaius Caesar mutinied, and in such a way as to seem to threaten even the life of their commander, he concealed his fear, and advancing straight to the soldiers with grim visage, readily granted discharge to those asking it. But these men were no sooner discharged than penitents forced them to apologize to their commander and to pledge themselves to greater loyalty in future enterprises. 10. How to Check an Unseasonable Demand for Battle after Quintus Sertorius had learned by experience that he was by no means a match for the whole Roman army, in order to prove this to the barbarians also, who were rashly demanding battle, he brought into their presence two horses, one very strong, the other very feeble. Then he brought up two youths of corresponding physique, one robust, the other slight. 
the stronger youth was commanded to pull out the entire tail of the feeble horse while the slight youth was commanded to pull out the hairs of the strong horse one by one then when the slight youth had succeeded in his task while the strong one was still vainly struggling with the tail of the weak horse sertorius observed by this illustration i have exhibited to you my men the nature of the roman cohorts they are invincible to him who attacks them in a body yet he who assails them by groups will tear and rend them when the same sertorius saw his men rashly demanding the signal for battle and thought them in danger of disobeying orders unless they should engage the enemy he permitted a squadron of cavalry to advance to harass the foe when these troops became involved in difficulties he sent others to their relief and thus rescued all showing more safely and without injury what would have been the outcome of the battle they had demanded after that he found his men most amenable when agesilaus the spartan was fighting against the thebans and had encamped on the bank of a stream being aware that the forces of the enemy far outnumbered his own and wishing therefore to keep his men from the desire of fighting he announced that he had been bidden by a response of the gods to fight on high ground accordingly posting a small guard on the bank he withdrew to the hills the thebans interpreting this as a mark of fear crossed the stream easily dislodged the defending troops and following the rest too eagerly were defeated by a smaller force owing to the difficulties of the terrain scurillo a chieftain of the dacians though he knew that the romans were torn with the dissension of the civil wars yet did not think he ought to venture on any enterprise against them inasmuch as a foreign war might be the means of uniting the citizens in harmony accordingly he pitted two dogs in combat before the populace and when they became engaged in a desperate encounter exhibited a wolf to them the dogs straightway abandoned their fury against each other and attacked the wolf by this illustration scurillo kept the barbarians from a movement which could only have benefited the romans end of section four recording by colleen mcmahon